responsible for basically coordinating information related to all things COVID-19, which as you all know is a lot right now. And so one of the things that in response to what we know is going on in the muni um, music therapy community is the rapid, rapid transition to telehealth for many of you, or the exploring of, of converting to uh, telehealth technology-based options. And so I have asked, and, and, and the committee has asked um, several folks, and I'm gonna let them introduce your, themselves, two of whom have a tremendous amount of experience with telehealth, and one who is rapidly transitioning and building all kinds of information and Rochelle's going, that's me. <laughs> so you all will get kind of uh, a great overview. They've worked together to really get um, some good information and, and share some basics with you. As Barb L said earlier, this call is being recorded. So we're gonna, as, as long as the recording is, is uh, of high enough quality, we're gonna make it available. Um, it is not pre-approved for CMTE credits, um, but you can count it following the CBMT procedures on your own. We are also working on uh, exploring some other options for continuing ed. Yeah, yeah I, guys, I see some of you are struggling to hear. Sorry about that. It, I'll do my best. It's just, it's just multiple people on my internet in my house. <laughs> because we're all working and schooling from home. Guess what, Laurie? We're going to talk about this today, and this is a great example of sometimes how we have to just adapt, and you're doing great. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, as I said, we're going to be recording and making it available with, uh, with, with po when possible and if possible, and then this will not actually be the only thing that we're putting out. There is going to be additional information released by the task force related to telehealth, and then um, just other matters as well, not just telehealth, but we're looking at, uh, we've sent out information about supporting faculty as they teach, and I'm one of those that's teaching day in and day out on, on Zoom. And so please just continue to watch the AMTA page, the AMTA social media sites, and things like that for updates. So to give them as much time as possible, because we have to be uh, off right at um, 1.59, I'm going to turn it over. And Rebecca, are you going to take take it first or who? I think I'll just, if you ladies want me to take it, we'll just get right into some music. <laughs> right, and just you guys introduce yourselves and tell them where you are as well and what you're doing. Excellent, thank you so much, Lori, and thanks for this invitation. We are so pleased to be here um, to sponsor this webinar about just our learned experiences and getting to share information on this. Uh, my name is Rebecca Vaudre. I am currently in Spencer, Massachusetts, which is between Central and Western Mass, so between Worcester and the Berkshires. Um, and I'm the lead music therapist for Creative Forces, which is an initiative for the National Endowment for the Arts that places music therapists, uh, dance therapists, and art therapists at military installations and VA clinics um, across the country, um, from Florida to Alaska. Um, we do have a telehealth component, which I will pass over to my colleague, Diane, to explain. Hi, my name is Diane Langston. I am in Gainesville, Florida, so I, it is actually really sunny out, which is delightful. Um, this is my first day home um, as I've continued to go into the clinic providing telehealth, which I've been doing for the past three years at the Malcolm Randall VA uh, in partnership with the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, so I'm continuing to work. Nothing has really changed in my practice. Um, but I'm really excited to be here and share some of my experiences with everybody. And with that, I'll pass it on to Rochelle and we'll get started. All right. Hey there. I'm Rochelle Morgan. I'm the owner of Soundscaping Source in Kansas City, Missouri, right here in the middle of the country. And like many music therapists, all of our clients, we can't see any of our clients in person right now. Um, we mostly work with older adults, so we can't go into senior living communities so we have started rapidly transitioning to telehealth just over the last few weeks. In our company, we've been doing a lot of online stuff, webinars and online resources for music therapists for many years. And so pretty comfortable online, but the transition to telehealth is a big learning curve for us, just like it is for anyone else who is starting this out new. So I'm the person here who is trying to figure things out in the private sector, things changing really fast and figuring out how to make things work for our team here at Soundscaping Source. 
So I've already learned a lot by talking with these two ladies. And so I'm really excited to be part of this webinar and, and get to share some of this wisdom with all of you as well. Yes, um, Do you want to go ahead and share the PowerPoint, Rochelle? Yep. So we're going to get this kicked off uh, with a little music because I'm sure as many of you, I've been sitting on um, the computer on webinars and interactives the past few weeks. And um, I think it's always great when we can kind of show this in action. Um, so again, this is our webinar, Music Therapy and Telehealth, Learning from Experience. And we're just going to get kicked off with a musical introduction. And I'd like to shape this actually as we might do this um, in a session um, with some clients. Not to say that Diane and Rochelle are my clients, but right now they are for all <laughs> intents and purposes for demonstration. Um, so how are you ladies doing today? Good. Um, I, as I said, this is my first day home. I'm really excited because I have been in the clinic for the past several weeks and so I'm really happy to be in my own home and see the garden and everything so I'm good. Great. Hmm, feeling happy to be home today. Yes, yes. All right. And I'm feeling a little bit scattered today because it was raining this morning and trying to help my kids with their home learning activities, their grade schoolers, kindergarten and third grade. It's been a little rough today so um, scattered. That's my word. <laughs> scattered. So I feel like, you know, I hear this um, right now, you're feeling a bit scattered, but you're also feeling happy to be home. Is there something maybe projected that you would like to see yourself um, in the future, a feeling or a thought or a state? I think for me, it's really just consistency of this feeling, um, just because I've been actually feeling more like Rochelle was saying, scattered in the past couple of uh, weeks with everything going on and so to be in the state is very exciting but I know that consistency is is key with all of this so just with maintaining this it's key consistency is key excellent uh, what about you Rochelle any projected state or thought or feeling I think I just want to feel grounded just grounded excellent um so we're going to do a, a quick musical check-in, and if everyone can see the chat, um, oh, it came up a little bit scattered, but that's all right. Um, I put some lyrics in. This song is Three Little Birds, and we're going to do a um, check-in song with lyric substitution. Um, if you're playing along at home, great. I would say please stay muted. Um, I'm going to play in the key of C, but if you have a table, a percussion instrument, a pen, um, <laughs> a kneecaps, anything you want to uh, play along with, that'd be great give you the interactive. Um, so we're going to get started and do a little check-in with our friends. So one, two, here we go. Saying don't worry, don't worry about a thing. Cause every little thing it's gonna be all right. Saying don't worry, don't worry about a thing, because every little thing is gonna be all right. Rise up this morning, smiled with the rising sun, feeling a bit scattered in the rain. I'm right. home singing sweet songs, melodies pure and true. Singing, this is my message to all of you. Saying, don't worry, don't worry about a thing, because every little thing will have consistency. It's key. Saying, don't worry, don't worry about a thing, because every little thing is gonna be grounded, and every little thing. Gonna be alright. Give it a rumble and stop. <laughs> nice job. Great. Okay, so we just want to give a little bit of a some experience here with what um, music making feels like, even with that lag time. Those are things that we have to figure out how to work with effectively as clinicians, but. They are things that we can figure out how to work with. And so that's kind of what we're going to be talking through in this webinar. 
And I think it's really important to emphasize too that we are by no means experts in all of this. We are still learning, even though, um, as we talked about earlier, Rebecca and I have been doing this for several years now. I by no means consider myself an expert because as we know, technology changes, um, innovations within music therapy change it. So we're just adapting and implementing that as we go. So I just want to be very clear that like we are by no means experts and you don't have to be an expert to do any of this. So maybe even more than that, we're already experts for music therapists, right? So we already have skills that we can apply in telehealth, just like we do anywhere else. So here's what we're going to cover in this webinar. We're going to talk about how to choose the best telehealth platform for your practice. We're going to talk about some of the differences and similarities for the music therapy process in telehealth versus in-person services. We'll identify some potential barriers for effective music therapy via telehealth and how to address them. And then we're also going to talk about some ethical issues to consider related to teletherapy, uh, music therapy. So um, let's see. Oh, and real quick to Rochelle, I just wanted to say, if you do have questions, you're doing a great job, just put those in the chat and we'll try and address them as we're going through. If we don't get to it in the middle of the presentation, we'll definitely um, answer them at the end. Yes, and we have a question here about whether you can get a copy of the PowerPoint. Yeah, we'll figure out how to make that happen, okay? Because we have a list of great resources at the end. We don't want you to miss that. Okay, so let's talk about platforms. And check out this picture of music therapy via telehealth in action. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> All right. So there are many platforms available and we don't want to spend too long on all the details here because it's going to vary depending on your practice and your clientele, what platform you're going to choose. But we want to give you some things to consider. One thing for sure that needs to happen on both ends of the teletherapy session is you both need to have a good internet connection. Um, as, as a therapist on the soundscaping source team or starting to do more teletherapy sessions, that's what we're running into more often than anything else is that the Wi-Fi is bad on the other end. And so they're not able to use any of the services that we can try. Um, so that's the first thing to check out is internet connection. If it can be hardwired, that's going to be your best bet. If you can be hardwired on your end, plugged into the ethernet, same thing on their end. If you can make that happen, then it's going to go a lot smoother. Um, we need to talk about or consider provider access and client access. So what kinds of software tools do you have available on your end? And are your, is your client going to be able to access that? So being able to access things easily is a really important piece of this puzzle here. Um, again, we work with older adults primarily, so they're not tech savvy as a population. So we have to make sure that um, people can just click a link and get into the session. Um, so that's a big consideration as well. And then of course, having time to do a test run is really important. You should be doing test runs with colleagues or peers to try out the technology and test the sound quality and things like that before you introduce it to clients. And then with your clients, you're also gonna need to allow some time for test runs as well. We have tried a couple of different things in our practice. Um, sometimes we do a test run just to test the technology and then have the session at a different time because of the way the the therapeutic process needs to go for that client. Um, so that's one thing to consider. Another thing to consider is allowing 15 minutes more in your sessions until you get the technology down, that you have that extra um, buffer there so that you can work through the tech stuff and then still be able to have your full session time with the client. Um, Diane, did you want to say anything about the technology that you guys use? In your practice. Absolutely, absolutely. So we're a little bit different um, because it is coming from a federal entity being the VA. They do provide the equipment for us. But I think some of the things that we were really looking at when we were exploring and developing the protocol is um, looking at what type of camera we had available. So right now, most of us are using a built-in camera, which is great. Um, but if you do have the availability to use two cameras, um, to help with the accessibility piece so that your, your client or patient can see two different angles if you're doing some kind of demonstration. Um, the other thing, of course, as we know, uh, sound quality gets a little wonky when it goes through technology. So again, what Rochelle said about testing each instrument and different um, tonalities through 
the system. Now, of course, it'll, it'll differ depending on the quality of your connection. Um, so just in, a, in accommodating for the latency, we'll get to that later, but just really thinking about the tone um, is really important too. So some things may work, some things may not, but it's always important to just test all that out. Um, and from an ethical perspective, we don't want to be testing, we want to minimize the amount that we're testing with, within a session, right? We want to do all that testing outside of music therapy sessions. Absolutely. Um, well, it, you know, it, on that level, you have to do some testing because if you test it with someone, like if I'm testing with Diane, which we've done, but then you have everything figured out, but that patient and your clients are going to have different bandwidth and connectivity from their space. So mm -hmm. every experience, just like in person, every ex uh, t music therapy and tele, every experience is kind of new to you and you're starting from um, that kind of ground zero, if you will, because even if you're working with the same person, uh, like we saw with Laurie um, in action, if more people are home working on their, using their connectivity, their connectivity may be slower. So you always have to have a little bit of time for testing at the beginning, but I 100% agree. Um, it's really best to try to be as savvy as you can with troubleshooting before going into the session with a patient. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so some of the platforms that we've looked at in our practice, and I know a lot of music therapy business owners are checking out, um, DocSeeMe is a telehealth platform that there's a free version that you can use and it's HIPAA compliant. Um, the problem with DocSeeMe is that they weren't prepared for such a huge influx of new people using their service. So it, people are having a lot of problems with um, dropped calls and lag time and, you know, just not working at all. So it, it's a good option. It may not work every time. So you might need to have a backup. Um, Zoom is another platform that you can use for telehealth. To get the HIPAA compliant version of Zoom, you have to pay, I think it's like $200 a month. Um, there has been an ease around um, HIPAA compliance with online platforms um, from the government perspective. So Zoom is one of those that you can use now, but you still need to make sure you're taking precautions um, and that the person you're working with is giving an informed consent for using a platform that's not strictly HIPAA compliant. Google Meet is one that is HIPAA compliant. If you have G Suite with a BAA already, then you can use Google Meet. That is part of that, even if you're working with people outside your domain. That was when I was researching last week. Um, and then Theranest and Simple Practice, those are both practice management software. And so they have a whole suite of tools, like you can bill and document all kinds of things within there. And part of what they include is a telemedicine platform. So those are both options to check out as well if you're willing to do, invest a, a little bit of money in, um, in the platform that you're using. I'm hearing from people that it is, those have been a little bit more reliable than DoxyMe has been. Now, as I mentioned with HIPAA compliance, this is a, a key concern. I mean, we still have our ethical um, obligation to protect confidentiality. Um, so this, you'll use your ethical decision-making process to decide which platform you're gonna use in your practice. But from a legal perspective, there has been guidance that, uh, from, I'm not even sure which government body, but there has been some easing around the restrictions there so that you're able to use what will work during this global pandemic when we're all trying to figure out how to deliver services virtually. Um, as long as you're doing things, um, with the best intentions and you're taking all the precautions that you can, then there is um, some allowance in there to use platforms that don't, aren't, it be, you, that you don't have a BAA with for HIPAA compliance right now, okay? Another thing to think about when you're considering the type of platform is whether you're gonna be doing groups or individual kinds of interactions. And if you're doing groups, is it gonna be people in the same place, like 10 people here and you on the camera? or are 10 people logging in from 10 different places. Each of these platforms has different capabilities as far as that goes. And so you wanna think about the kinds of sessions that you're gonna to wanna to run and how that's gonna work for you. Let's see, I see the chat working here. Yeah, there's a question about the G Suite. I don't know if you wanna address that, um, Michelle, with the okay. HIPAA compliance with that one. All right, and Barb else is telling us that it's the Office of Civil Rights on HIPAA is the one who's eased the restrictions there. So I, Kelsey, I, I don't have time to look at it right now. Um, I'll see if we can include it in the resources and in the, in the PowerPoint.
but there is a document if you Google, if you Google Google Meet HIPAA compliance, it'll pull up a document from Google that explains all that. So I'll see if I can track down a link for you afterwards. Okay, so platforms, we talked a little bit about instrumentation. We talked a little bit about population of facility. Um, one thing that we've been doing in our practice is um, putting, we put together a cheat sheet for logging on and using tech. So for people that have no idea what to do, we made it very easy. You know, step one, click this, step two, click this. Uh, and that's been helping um, along with a whole lot of communication with the people on the other end about the technical issues. Another consideration is with staffing availability. If you're gonna need somebody to run the technology on the other side, or if you're gonna need somebody to provide hand over hand assistance or um, other kinds of queuing for your clients, that's something you need to think about as well. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over now to talk about music therapy utility. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we're talking about um, on these different platforms, maybe how we can see some integration. Um, what we've seen is this technology, um, this innovation um, happening, which is stemming new apps, but what are some things that we can integrate into these platforms? So thinking about um, using perhaps Spotify or Apple Music for purposeful playlist making, um, or musician is an example for active music making, ways that you can track people's progress um, as they're doing their own asynchronous work. But then when you come together for that synchronous um, work, if that's what you're going to be doing, being able to kind of pick up and understand what they've, what they've done um, and completed in the time between, like you would in a traditional um, music therapy session. Using Google, Docs. This is an example you can see here um, on the side for doing lyric analysis. Um, also songwriting. So you can add things in and you can um, track or work together on something um, while you're in the moment and it will update. Uh, also thinking about um, songwriting and then recording that using GarageBand. Um, this is able to be done. It's again, you have to kind of have a learning curve on the technology um, and to be able to give that um, remotely, but I think that this is something that you can work with with your patients so they can still have that process driven um, product through uh, telecommunications and teleresponse. So looking at synchronous versus asynchronous ways that you can connect with your patients using integration on other platforms because yet we, we've yet to find one platform that kind of does it all. Um, so these are just different ways that you can interact and exchange. Yeah, and another thing too, as far as the instrumentation goes, there are um, software and instruments that you can connect and sync up. Um, I know an example of one is a Yamaha um, EZ220. There's a system that they have um, that you can see, you can play on one end and it can appear on the other person's end. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to test it because the VA is very strict about what we're allowed to have on our computers. Um, but I know that it is possible, and uh, Rebecca and I have a really good resource, um, or most of you probably know, Lori um, with Clavinova, uh, and she's a really great resource and loves to help uh, music therapists out in, in learning about that. Um, and so, and then also with the collaboration piece, for those of you who may be working in more, um, within more strict limitations such as federal entities or hospitals, um, we have secured messaging. So that's how I'm able to collaborate um, with my veterans. I think too, one more thing going off that, um, using, uh, if you want to make sure that patients are actually adhering to their treatment plan, um, you can use a Google Doc or some sort of, like you were saying, shared um, networking platform to make task lists and see if they go in and um, they can journal what they've been doing. So you know when to give a little push when you have to. Cool. Uh, I want to share this, a couple comments from the chat. Uh, Barb L said that we, AMTA will have an additional resource coming out soon that has a reference to HIPAA rules relaxation for telehealth. So watch for that. And then Dr. Gooding, Lori Gooding said that if you work through a, a facility like a school system that has a learning management system, LMS, Zoom might be embedded with that, within that, which would enhance the FERPA and HIPAA compliance. So you wanna make sure you check on all of those things if you're working for an organization that's providing you with a platform, some of that stuff might already be taken care of for you. Okay, so let's talk about the clinical process. Diane's gonna take this section and we're gonna talk about how in-person and telehealth are the same and different. 
Yeah, so as I mentioned before, um, I've been doing this for the past three years. I kind of came into doing telehealth and providing music therapy via telehealth as a huge skeptic. Um, I thought this is ridiculous, I'll try it, but I don't think this is going to work. Um, and I have been completely proven wrong um, and I'm continuing and that's ev as evidenced by me continuing to work despite everybody staying at home. So that's been really cool to see that. Um, but the referrals for, for us, they're essentially the same. Obviously they've slowed down a bit, um, but we were kind of troubleshooting this as we were discussing this, uh, Rochelle, Rebecca and I, and we found that you know telehealth also provides us an option to do in-services via telehealth. Um, so we can educate the staff or folks we interact with the community at large about um, some of the things that music therapy can help address. Um, and so part of that referral process is the education piece. And then we talk about telehealth and go through all the processes of how does it work? Why are we using it? Making sure we receive consent for that. So essentially it's, the same, except for having somebody come into the clinic um, or into your office, you just meet in this, this platform. And so that being said, going into the assessment, um, we've been able to do the same assessments that we would do, maybe doing a couple of adaptations, you know, working through camera angles or slowing down speech or working with latency, but it's still essentially the same thing. And so through that assessment, we're able to evaluate and set specific treatment goals. Um, so, you know, ideally it would be an in-person. That's what we typically do is we do in-person um, consults and then we go to the telehealth platform. However, we've been able to um, manage that and navigate that with everything going on. Let me make a comment on um... The sure. referrals piece for private practices. Uh, we already had all of our, for private clients, we already had all of our intake forms on our website. And um, we're setting up a calendar now so that people can even pick their session times online as well. So um, if you haven't already figured that out in your private practice, that's, this might be something you want to work on now. You can also uh, make sure that you get your informed consent on your website as well. Uh, we do on ours. And mm -hmm. You need to make sure you add a consent for telehealth. There's a template for that on the AMTA COVID-19 resource pages. And um, it just spells out some things like, you know, technology might fail. And that's part of what you're understanding that you're consenting to. Right. We also have that link um, on our resource page here on this presentation. So you can pull it. Yeah, and so then transitioning from, you know, that going through that clinical process, uh, going into the interventions. Um, I have most experience with the individual, but we are looking to do the group, and that's not just um, me being in one place and the group being somewhere else. That's one option, but there's also me being in one place and each person connecting individually. Um, I don't have as much experience with that, but it is possible. We are doing this now, so obviously it's, it's a little bit different. Um, but going through and doing sessions, conducting, doing the same interventions, I do a lot of um, re relaxation, music assisted relaxation. Um, I've done active music making, we've done call and response. Um, different, I mean, essentially what you could do in person, you can do via telehealth. You just have to make sure you're mindful of and consider all of these things that might be um, a challenge. But I've used that as part of the therapeutic process, you know, doing that, okay, you're getting frustrated. I noticed this, like, let's process it. How can we work through this? Um, and so I've seen that be a really positive um, part of my clinical practice. And I so think um, the group consideration for that, and this is something that, you know, Diane and I, you know, often talk about um, is that it is a great um, gauge for being able to work on frustration tolerance um, or emotional regulation. Uh, and it really does work well in individuals. When you're working with groups, as um, Diane was saying, there's specific considerations um, and you have to kind of gauge if other people are being triggered by uh, the type of bandwidth or connectivity or kind of the overlap from latency because we definitely don't want ha to have any experiences be counter therapeutic. Um, so where we can work on that, we also have to be aware when we're working with groups uh, about how other people are responding. 
Um, so just some really quick group considerations. Um, as Diane was saying, where is everyone located? Are you in two places? For example, you're in one place and the clients are in another space, um, which lends itself to more group work and cohesion on their part. Or are you in separate spaces, uh, like we all are now, um, engaged in connectivity and bandwidth prior, um, but also at the beginning of each session, if it's available, um, during warm-ups like we did here, um, using group music making, improvisational through turn taking. So people aren't playing over each other and they're hearing something different in every space they're at, depending on what their connectivity issues are. Um, call and response we found to be very helpful because it leaves that space for people to create and kind of take turns um, leading and then responding and validating other people. Um, this is for use of like, uh, less bandwidth uh, situations, um, and just providing auditory space. Um, we need to social distance right now, and I think like space is a huge issue um, across the facets of it, facets of in person um, and tele. So starting slow, like we did, you know, and like you would in a normal session, things will speed up musically. Um, so I think having um, the use of just being able to have a bunch of tricks up your sleeve and being adaptable and flexible. If something's not working, don't keep doing it. Just kind of adapt as, um, as the session is flowing. One thing that we've learned from doing some telehealth sessions with groups in senior living communities is that it's, it's pretty challenging to have 10 people on the other side of the camera. Um, if they don't have like a microphone or something set up, it can be very difficult to hear. So it's been important for us to have a person on the other side of the on the other side of the computer with that group there to help give the, the therapist feedback about what's happening in the room. Um, of course, less than ideal, but it is something that you know that we can work with right now. Um, yeah, I think cueing too, like sometimes we can't see, like we might have to make more exaggerated motions as a facilitator um, than you would in person. Um, if you saw when I was playing the ukulele in the beginning, I counted in, but then I was trying to really, really strum so people could see that downbeat. Um, so anything you can do, but you're right, Rochelle, in places where maybe people are visually impaired or you're on a smaller screen, you're not projected on a huge screen. Um, so you have to, having someone there is definitely helpful. Um, I think too, really something important about group work is doing some work with um, your, you know, your peers and your groups, um, just to kind of replenish yourself. This file right here that you're seeing, this image is a garage band, and I don't know how, if you can see the different tracks, um, but they're different states. And this is a project we did pre-COVID um, just for, you know, like Diane said, we're all, um, over the country in our network. Um, so sometimes we like to do projects and people just use, you know, something as simple as their device to record on. Some people have interfaces and much more um, prestigious uh, technology to work with, but anything that you have, you can send um, audio tracks and then use platforms like GarageBand to um, create something together. So this is asynchronous work that comes together to create a collective um, piece. And it, it really is just a lot of fun. So this is something you can work with, um, with your, with your patients or clients, and also just to, to do with your peers, to connect. Great. You probably, uh, some of you already do this work, but it's just something nice to show. Yeah. Um, I wanna have a question here for you guys to answer. Uh, Maggie Rogers asked, when proximity is so important with clients, would you sit closer to the camera so your face is closer and in full view, or is it important for them to see the instrument with a wide camera angle? Yeah, so this is something I play with all the time. It just depends on the person, depends on what their needs. If they if they do need to see my face, of course I'll move forward. But if we're working on more extensive things where they have to see, um, what I've done too is I've brought the guitar forward or I brought the camera to the keyboard and I've kind of gone back and forth. Um, so it, it really depends on what your patient or client's needs are. Again, that's the communication thing. So just like, hey, you know, is this helpful? Just like we would do if we were in person. Whereas, you know, now we have to ask versus kind of observing their behaviors. So it's, it is a little bit different, but um, I think that it's absolutely adoptable. Um, I think for me, the, the patients too, like if you're sitting close and they can't see something that you're modeling, 
um, then that will be difficult. Also knowing where your, where your microphone is, if you're using internal mics and you get too close, it might sound like you're, you know, shouting or you might clip the microphone, which sound, which does not have a pleasant sound on the other end as we've been testing with different <laughs> instruments and, um, distance from the mics. So knowing your audio and your technology too, about how is that changing your projection? Um, maybe it will make you visibly closer, but maybe you're really loud now. So you have to turn down um, your microphone. Absolutely. So that being said, um, we're going to go into our relaxation really quick, but just kind of demonstrate um, throughout the different, throughout the PowerPoint, um, different instrumentation um, to see how it sounds. Um, so I have got a happy drum in the key of G major. Um, Rebecca's got an ocean drum. So we're going to just take a moment. I'm going to start creating um, the space. So if you just want to take a moment, we're all dealing with stress, anxiety, uncertainty. Just take a few minutes. These are just examples. Obviously, it's going to be a little bit different um, for each platform, for each connection. Um, we troubleshooted this um, earlier this week. It sounded great. It sounded okay. But of course, with more people, with more folks sharing the platform, it might sound a little bit distorted. So, so and I think that it's depending on your personal bandwidth. So from here, it didn't sound distorted at all. So I think it also depends on um, all y'all's connectivity out there about how that sounds coming through. And these are definite considerations, which is why um, it's good to test yes. for. But I, again, and we're gonna get into this about nothing being perfect really quickly before we move on. Um, you know, we're working with what we can now, but something that you can use if you don't have, um, you know, you wanna make some relaxation, like Diane says, that's one of the, um, techniques that she uses that is very well received. Um, Barb saying they're putting out some information about that specific to relaxation, but there's an app called Relax Melodies. Um, and I'll just play for a moment what could simulate an ocean drum. Right now I'm connected to a speaker. So this is the sound of it using an external speaker. I'm going to turn this off and you can hear it over just the phone. So just a quick example of using um, web-based apps to help simulate sound. And just so you're aware, if you're using Zoom, there are a couple of settings that you can work with. Um, someone in the chat, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name, I mentioned the original sound option in Zoom. Um, I can't control that because right now because of the slide sharing and stuff, but there's under your settings there, I think there's something you can click. Um, I can't figure that out right now. There's also a way to share computer audio. So you can play something over your computer and it sounds great on the other end. I did that with a client mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago playing music through Spotify and it sounded on her end like it was playing from her computer originally. So those are, again, those are tricks you have to figure out depending on which platform you use. The other thing too is if you have apps like Spotify and your, your patients have uh, or clients have the same apps, putting yourselves on mute and if you're doing a listening, just listening from your own end. So you can just have that like in the moment, you don't have to worry about um, the sound transmitting over. Absolutely. And really quick, before we move on into the challenges, I did also want to say that with the clinical process, um, we've been able to do reevaluation and discharge. Actually, that's been really nice to kind of transition them into their community. And so 
um, it's been really cool to actually experience, you know, them in their homes and their, in the setting of their comfort. Uh, I work with an art therapist and she's been able to go actually with the, the veterans into their community to a community artist and be there as a support. And so that they're still experiencing, you know, the community resource, but they're also getting the support from the therapist as well. I see this as something very useful and I've been able to, I can't refer people to folks in the community, but to give them the support as they are reaching out and trying to assimilate back into society or just engage differently um, with their community. So it's actually been a really nice warm handoff because they're already there. I don't have to search out. They know their community best. So um, essentially they are taking control over their treatment and over, you know, reaching those goals. So. There we okay, and I, I, um, one thing we didn't talk about during the referral intake and assessment process that came up in the, um, that's come up in the chat is, you know, can you work with, with young children who have multiple disabilities? Can you work with people who need a whole lot of hand over hand support? Um, one thing that is, I mean, this is just reality, is that some clients telehealth is not appropriate for them. Um, we are not doing telehealth visits with our, our clients that have advanced dementia who would be confused by seeing us on a screen. Um, we had one client that we tried a session with just to see how it would go, and it was really disorienting for him um, to have the music therapist on the screen instead of in the room, and so we made the decision that uh, music therapy by telehealth was not appropriate for him. So that that is going to be the reality for some clients, that it's not... Um, it's not appropriate. And th so that's a decision that you'll make as a clinician. Um, however, there are, I think there are a lot more possibilities here than a lot of us were able to see before. So that's why we're really focusing on that piece of it. Um, let's see, somebody said, I work with clients who have more cognitive challenges and less verbal, they need more support in general. Making it work, but relying on mom to tell me what he indicates for picture choices. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, so intervention tips for specific populations is definitely a topic that we'll probably have to come with a later webinar, <laughs> but, that, but those are things that we need to be sharing with each other so that we can Absolutely. figure out how to do those things. And I work with folks with uh, TBI. They're mild to moderate, so it's not severe, but, you know, they're still able to um, follow those directions with the support of their caregiver. Um, so absolutely involving the family, the caregiver in this process as well. So you know, again, I agree with Rochelle, we're just going to have to <laughs> work with that as we move forward. But I've seen a lot of really good transfers from in-person to the telehealth platform. Okay, let's address some of the telehealth challenges that we have not talked about already. <laughs> yes. So as we know, it's not perfect. Um, but I mean, I would make the argument what session, we also have sessions that aren't perfect in person. So the biggest thing that, you know, I've seen as a positive for my, like I said, for my practice, for the folks I'm working with is we're flexible, we're adaptable. That's part of life. And so it's a life skill that people need to be conscientious of or aware of, but you know, it, that's where we are at this point. And we've been here as a human race forever. We've had to adapt and overcome. And so this is just another aspect. So it's, it's not impossible. It's frustrating as a clinician. It's frustrating as a patient. It's frustrating for everybody, but we're all in this together. It's, it's definitely um, really exciting to see it being utilized more. This technology has been around since the 60s with NASA and astronauts, so it's not new. We are just new to implementing it as a tool, and that's all it is. Um, it is a tool to utilize now, especially because we're being forced to, but also for accessibility for our, our patients and our clients who may physically not be able to come into a clinic or who may not want to because it's a trigger um, and so we think about all these different ways that we can not just incorporate it now, but looking at it in the future and creating a space where we can provide access to care to more people. Um, we are still a, a small population as far as clinicians. And so this really has been able to, um, I think we'll be able to enhance our practice and our advocacy for what we're doing um, and how we're helping people. 
So I have to say, I just 100% agree. I'm excited. I mean, of all the, you know, challenges that I've experienced, there's always that level of excitement where like, okay, you're overcoming it. When a challenge happens, that's just an opportunity for us to learn something new and augment even further and just become better at our practices and refine it. Um, I think that I, for one, just to echo you, Diane, I'm very, very excited about even after um, this kind of craze of COVID is over and we're, we get to kind of breathe and, and look at what we've accomplished and come, you know, seeing what's worked, identified, you know, what, what's, not worked and what's worked to really um, help spread the access to our patients um, in the best way we can in the clinical side. And then again, also to echo Diane on that community side um, is going to help with that continuity of care. Um, just speaking really quickly um, about depletion and renewal. Um, so something I have experienced um, and I'm sure um, many of you have is being attached to a computer for so many hours a day is draining um, mentally, physically, um, and you have energy drains. We're going to experience this um, through asynchronous work and also through types of synchronous work like um, meetings and admin versus creative and remote co-working and um, connectivity. Um, so making sure we just can find a balance. There isn't a one-size-fits-all balance. Um, just like there isn't a one-size-fits-all implementation of telehealth. It's really just knowing what's right for you. Um, remembering no matter how much you're replenishing um, and recharging um, through maybe synchronous work and, you know, exchanging energy, making music um, remotely with your friends, there's also power in unplugging sometimes and just um, walking away from your computer, closing it, resting your eyes um, and your brain. Um, so I think we need to know that we need to stay mentally and physically well. Um, if we don't, and this, you know, the drain can happen before we notice it. It can just kind of sneak up on us and we're like, oh, we're on low battery. Um, but I think that maintaining our mental and physical health, because um, if we don't have that, then we're not able to provide support for others in the best way we can, um, which kind of bridges us to our next topic of ethics. Yes. And I see some questions pouring into the um, group chat. So we will um, get to those. <laughs> But we're going I to did about. feel the let's get ethical from the office. I'm just going to say that I didn't give it any credit on here, but I did. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, look at all those beautiful music therapists. Yeah, so this is our team um, from Creative Forces. We had a big, um, at the end of our meeting, we had a jam session, um, which Rebecca facilitated for us. And it wasn't horrible. Um, so we were really excited about that. Um, it was contained to 25, which is why I wasn't ready to jump to 100 today. I thought I'd go up like incrementally by maybe 25 and a quarter. Sound good. Um, learning curve. <laughs> but it's good. To know. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So let's let's talk about some ethical considerations here. And then we'll take some questions with the few minutes we'll have left. So as with any new way of practicing, whether it's a new technique or a new method, anything, we have to think um, make sure that we're using those tools with all of our ethical considerations in mind. So there are not, we don't have any black and white rules in our code of ethics that tell us use internet, don't use internet, use the computer, don't use it. We don't have anything like that. And um, what we do have are our principles and then some operationalization. That's a big word. Operate operation. I can't say it, the, um, the 5.3 and 2.6 and 2.1 are to help us operationalize the principles that are outlined in the code of ethics. The so principle five is one that I think we can keep um, top of mind and this is striving for excellence. Striving for excellence does not imply perfection, but the ongoing commitment to expand our knowledge and skills in all areas. As we've discussed, you know, perfection is not possible in any area of practice and we're not gonna be perfect with teletherapy right off the bat. There's going to be technical hiccups, just like sometimes you have somebody, you know, a janitor coming in and running a vacuum during the middle of your music therapy session in assisted living. So um, it's not going to be perfect, but we're going to be committed to continuing to get better at our service delivery through telehealth. 5.3 tells us specifically that we need to use caution, critical thinking, and strong consideration of the best available evidence when we're incorporating new and evolving interventions and technologies into our practice, education, or supervision. 
So everybody here watching this webinar is doing a good job of that because we don't have a lot of published articles on telemusic therapy at this point. Um, but we do have people who are sharing their expertise in various formats. And so by seeking that out, you're getting some of the best possible evidence that is out there. And hopefully we're all going to be contributing to that evidence base as we move forward with our telehealth practice. 2.6, I think, is a big one for us during this time. We need to seek peer and professional supervision to assist with the reflection and practice improvement. So this is a really important time to make sure you're connecting with peers in various places and talking through some of these hitches and hiccups together so that we can deliver our services better. Um, this is an ethical requirement that we um, seek supervision for, and probably a lot of peer supervision at this point since we don't have a lot of experts on telehealth. Um, Soundscaping Source, we're doing a peer supervision group weekly. I've seen, um, I know Annette Whitehead Plo is doing some supervision groups and there's others that are available elsewhere. Um, maybe if we hear of more, if anybody wants to drop some in the chat, we can put them on the resource list um, so people can find some assistance that way. I think AMTA is working on some peer buddy stuff too that might help with that. Um, and then 2.1 tells us that we need to act with the best interest of clients in mind at all times. So we know that a lot of our folks, they need therapy, right? They need music therapy. You know, if they go two months, three months, four months without music therapy, then that's not, that's not the best thing for clients. And so figuring out how to make telehealth work in the meantime um, is ethical practice, you know, because you're putting, you're putting those, the client needs first. Um, the other thing we have to think about too, though, is that a lot of us are losing income because we're not able to see our clients in person. So we don't want to make this a financial thing, like I'm fin I need money, so I'm going to try to get as many of my people on telehealth as possible. We want to make sure that we're putting the client's interest first and not the financial piece. Both are important considerations, um, but we want to make sure that we're, you know, not forcing someone into health telehealth when they don't want to or when it's not appropriate for them. Those are some of the things that have been in my mind as we've been moving forward with telehealth. If you don't take away anything else from the ethics discussion, it is this. We have ethical decision-making models in the new Code of Ethics in Appendix 2. Those will walk you through the decision-making process. So if you have a tough decision come up in your business related to telehealth, then you can use those decision-making models to help you make a good decision for your practice, okay? So keeping ethics top of mind is something that we wanna do all the time, even when things are changing really rapidly. And it's when things are changing really rapidly that we need to be especially careful to make sure that we're using all of our ethical thinking and decision-making skills. I just wanna say and affirm that in a time where, you know, HIPAA compliance is kind of being um, blurred and some strings are being loosened, I think what we can always adhere to are our code of ethics. We have these as a foundation and these will never change. Um, so from now into when this is over and things kind of go back to um, quote unquote business as usual, <laughs> um, although it will never be the same again, um, we can always rely on our ethics to kind of keep us grounded in our practice. Yes. Great. Okay. Um, so in conclusion. Yeah, I think, again, like I said at the beginning, here's some, you can go ahead and put the resources up. I think this is really important to know that, you know, we are a big network, we, but we are a small enough network where we can utilize our resources. So utilize your community, utilize your resources, um, not just in the national ones, the state ones, your regional, whatever makes sense, but we are all here to support each other. Um, and we are very fortunate. We have very knowledgeable people within our network. And if they don't know, then they'll find the answer from somebody else. Um, so that is just my biggest advice is, you know, utilize your network, utilize um, what you know, um, and then basing everything, you know, on that ethical perspective, but also, you know, your training. We've all been trained to deal and address and go into things and not have any idea what to expect. Here we are. This is the ultimate challenge. Um, and so I think this is, this is a really great opportunity. Um, it's, it's scary, it's anxiety saturated, but you know, we are here to support our, our clients, our patients, but we're also here to support each other. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to see what happens in the future. I'm really excited to see 
um, how music therapy evolves, um, there's a lot of really positive things to come out of this. So I know we don't have a lot of time, but um, if we did not address your question, I know that after the Zoom meeting ends, the chat kind of goes away. So if you do have any questions, um, I'm, I'm happy to, I'm not gonna offer for both Rochelle and Rebecca, but if you, if you wanna email us um, or be in contact with us, I know uh, Lori will be happy to put you in touch with us. Uh, if you have any questions or any kind of um, things that we didn't address. I don't know if Rebecca, Rochelle, do you wanna add anything else? Yeah, feel free to reach out to me, I'm available. Great. Um, there's a couple of questions. Let's see, we have like, we'll say two minutes before we have to log off. So um, there was one question in here about ethics. Has anyone discussed changing rates for services when transitioning to in, from in-person to telehealth? Um, the thing on that is that there's something called um, telehealth parity in a lot of states that require insurance companies to pay the same for um, telehealth sessions as in-person sessions. That's not standard across the board everywhere, but I think it's a good standard for us to follow in private practice that our rates should be the same um, for that live time that we spend, that time sh that should be the same. Um, so that I think that's the direction that music therapists tend to be moving. Um, if you think about it, that people are saving time and, time and money by not having to leave. They're, you know, they can do it from anywhere, so. It's already kind of like getting a discount. Yep, yep, yep. Um, it becomes a little bit different if you're starting to package different kinds of digital services. That gets a little bit more complicated. But if you're just doing strict like an, a 45-minute session in person versus 45-minute session telehealth, it should be the same price-wise. Yes, and I don't know anything about IEPs, so that's that's a great question for Barb. I just saw that in the um, yes. chat. I don't know. Great. Awesome. Well, I think we are done. Thank you so much again for all of you for participating, for being a part of this. Again, moving forward, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We are here to support um, as we have been getting support. So we're all in this together and um, happy to continue to provide knowledge as we learn um, in our practices and you know, I'm sure we'll be able to share more resources moving forward. So thank you all for being a part of this. Good luck, everybody, with your endeavors. Yeah. All right. And thank you, everyone, for being leaders. Yes. <laughs>